Welcome everyone to the last session of today, probably the most interesting one. I am uh, Håkan Nilsson, a professor at Chalmers University of Technology. I'm chairing this session. Uh, we have four presenters and uh, they have 15 minutes per uh, slot, 10 minutes uh, presentation and five minutes of questions. So please uh, state your questions in the live Q&A in the system and I will pick them up and uh, ask the presenters those questions after each presentation. You can also discuss in the discussion forum if you like uh, and just post the questions to the presenters in the live Q&A. So we will start by uh, first speaker which is Dr. Said Salehi from Chalmers University of Technology on a uh, talk on uh, simulation of Kaplan turbine transients, a novel open form framework. So please go ahead, Said. Uh, thank you, Håkan. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Not anymore. Yeah, no, no, I shared the wrong screen. Okay, do you, do you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Said Salehi. I'm a postdoc at Chalmers University of Technology. And today I'm going to talk about simulation of Kaplan turbine transients, which has been handled through a novel open form framework that we have recently developed. So uh, nowadays, hydropower systems like uh, hydro turbines, they uh, are being used uh, more and more uh, in, in, in varying operating conditions. Uh, so this could cause very hazardous fluctuations and instabilities. Uh, and by transient, we mean that uh, turbine load can change, flow rate can change, uh, guide vane angles, runner blade angles, rotational speed, everything can change during this transient. And we have different types of transient modes like uh, load acceptance, load rejection, shutdown and, and uh, etc. So specifically, if you focus on the Kaplan turbine during uh, a transient procedure, we have simultaneous rotation of runner as a solid body change of guide vane angles, and also change of each runner blade angle. So we have different types of uh, mesh motion in simulation of such, uh, such procedures. So we have a uh, runner, which is rotating as a solid body. We have mesh deformation of the runner mesh because the runner, the blade angle is changing. So we can imagine each blade is rotating around its own axis. Guide vane also mesh deformation of guide vane. So each guide vane is also rotating around its own axis. And uh, we could also have flow driven rotation of runners. So we could have like uh, variable rotational speed. So the methodology to, to, to simulate this, this whole complex phenomenon is not quite uh, uh, available uh, is in open form, but I, I will explain it more. So in open form, the standard mesh morphing approach is that we just simply solve the Laplacian equation for the displacement of the cell centers. And then because we need displacement of the point, points, we interpolate that displacement of the cells onto the point locations to find uh, displacements of the points. And then we could simply calculate the new points location, which as you see in these figures on the right. Uh, and the boundary condition are also imposed on the points location. But the problem here in the Kaplan turbine transient is that uh, the points should be able to slip on the curved surfaces like hub and shroud surface. And the general slip condition cannot handle this because it's a very sensitive boundary condition and it's an explicit, it has an explicit uh, implementation. So as you can see formula here, the general slip condition no, uh, just uh, simply removes the normal component of whatever quantity that you are working with. Here we are working with uh, displacement. So it uses it it uses its own value to correct to correct itself. So it's therefore it's an explicit implementation and it does not contribute to the coefficient matrix. And therefore, uh, 
this causes a very big problem, which is that the points that are inside domain, they are not aware of this slipping. They cannot feel this boundary. So as you can see here, this is a uh, deformation, deformation in a couple of turbines. So the green here is shroud, the blade is red, and this gray area is uh, the inside point. So uh, if you look at here, uh, the region here, you can see the points are getting closer and closer to the shroud and they finally hit the shroud and we have negative volume, we get negative volume and the simulation is destroyed. Uh, another problem is that we have very small clearances in uh, Kaplan turbines. You can see tip clearance here on the leading edge side of the blade, which is getting smaller and smaller. So here, for example, we have a clearance of 0 0.5 millimeter, which is getting squeezed so the mesh deformation is that in that area is quite uh, unstable and challenging. But what we have done, we have developed a new framework in which that we solve the uh, Laplacian equation twice instead of once. So in the first step, which, which we call predictor step, we use the uh, normal, uh, normal uh, or general slip condition to slip the points on the curved surface. And then we extract that displacement and impose it as a Dirichlet condition for the corrector step. And then we solve the displacement again. So each of these steps has, has their own diffusivity as well. So with this uh, implementation, now the point inside uh, can feel that, that uh, boundary movement or, or that boundary curvature. So as you can see here, they might get closer to the shroud, but they don't hit the shroud. So we can deform mesh for a larger uh, angles. So I have a very simple test case here to show. Here is a bump and we have a moving band boundary and a fixed boundary here and uh, points on this bump and on this uh, uh, top boundary should, should slip on these two boundaries. So if you use general slip, you can see the slip condition is quite unstable and uh, the mesh will be destroyed short, uh, shortly after the simulation starts and you cannot continue because uh, there are a lot of negative volumes and so on. But there is an alternative in open foam which you can, uh, you can, you can slip the points on a pre-specified surface. So here I use a steel surface and I... Uh, I um, I'm slipping the points on these steel surfaces. That problem, that stability problem is solved, but another problem shows itself that you can see the points inside cannot feel or cannot see this, this bump here. So uh, as, we, as we are deforming the mesh, uh, these points uh, and the in, uh, inside points gets closer and closer to the bump and they will hit the bump and uh, we have negative volume. But through our developed methodology, this problem is solved. As you can see, we have a very improved mesh deformation here. The point inside actually follow this bump curvature and uh, they don't uh, hit the, the boundary and we could actually deform the mesh for a very larger uh, angles or a longer period of time. Another challenge is that we have simultaneous mesh deformation and solid body rotation. So a standard solid body displacement Laplacian function that is already available in open foam. That's just what it does is that it applies the Laplacian displacement on top of solid body transformation. And that only works for rigid body translation when something is translating as a rigid, rigid body and not rotating. But we have developed another uh, 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 framework or library for this that uh, it actually transforms both initial points and displacement field and it works for, for any kind of movement. So if you can see here, uh, this is the standard open foam um, solid body displacement Laplacian and this is our new solid body Laplacian that you can see this doesn't work on a standard um, solver uh, of open foam because you can see the blade or this thing that is oscillating here is getting larger and smaller. So the geometry is getting, it's changing. But here we have a nice oscillation and at the same time rotation. So eight this minutes. is the, uh, sorry? That was eight minutes. Okay, yeah. 
uh, and uh, this is the flowchart of our developed methodology, uh, which is developed, which is shown here inside the pimple loop. So the green box is the pimple loop, and here is our methodology. So uh, there are a lot, a lot of details here, which uh, I'm not going through. Uh, well, obviously because of time. So we tested our methodology on the on a real Kaplan turbine, which is a uh, which is a uh, Kaplan model turbine called uh, Porius U9 model, which is a model of a real prototype turbine located in the uh, northern part of Sweden. So it contains 10, 10 million cells here. As you can see, the mesh deformation is working quite well on the whole uh, system. And uh, I, just, I, I just want to mention that in, in all these movies, the runner is rotating as a uh, solid body with full speed, but we are looking at, the, uh, at a fixed position with an ostroboscopic view. So it, it works quite well and uh, we can deform the mesh for a large angle. So uh, quickly, just to show uh, uh, a few results, uh, you can see that we have two probe, pressure probes and we have uh, captured very well. If, if you look at the short time Fourier transform of the pressure, we have uh, captured the uh, rotor stator interaction very well, it's harmonics and also some low frequency oscillations due to vortex rope in probe two, uh, because it's uh, inside draft tube. Uh, here you can see a video from the vertical structures inside uh, draft tube during the transient procedure. And uh, yeah, it, this is the load rejection procedure. So best efficiency point to part load and it's, um, it's it, the results are um, quite well. 10 minutes. So, mm, yeah. So the explicit boundary condition uh, is not numerically stable and the inside points cannot feel it. A novel numerical, open, uh, a novel numerical framework is uh, in, in open form is introduced to address this complex dynamic mesh. Two different displacement fields are defined and the Laplace equation are solved for each of them. Current framework make inside points aware of uh, slip surfaces. The developed methodology was successfully tested on a Kaplan turbine model. So uh, in this presentation, we did, not, we did not have enough time to go through all the details, but if you are interested to hear more about the details of this work, you can join a variant of group, uh, Gothenburg Region Open Form User Group Meeting, which is held uh, next week, June 18th. If you are interested to join, you can just uh, contact Professor Hawkan Nielsen from Chalmers, and uh, he uh, and we will gladly invite you to, to this meeting as well. So I just want to thank SVC for the funding of this project and SNIC for allocating computational facility. And thank you all for listening. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, now we have time for some questions. So please type your questions in the live Q and A. So um, it seems like the uh, there's no question yet, but uh, this slip condition here seems to be quite uh, uh, risky to use. The original slip condition. Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah. And I, I, I would say that it doesn't work uh, almost on on the, any of the cases. So, it, at least for the for the dynamic mesh procedure or for the point displacement field, the slip condition, the general slip condition should never be used. There are other alternatives like fixed normal slip or, or self slip displacement, uh, which is the second one here you can see. Uh, these are more stable, but the problem with these boundary conditions is that the point inside does not, are not aware of the uh, curved surface, so they don't work on highly curved surfaces. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's see. We only have a couple of comments here that, uh, as far as I can see, I should update actually my refresh my data, but uh, simply some cheering here. Great work, impressive work. So please, uh, you, as you heard, you can join on Friday next week if you like uh, and listen to a lot of more details. So let's switch to the next uh, presenter, uh, which is uh, Dr. Tessa Uruch from uh, Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and Naval Architecture in Zagreb. Uh, and uh, she's presenting uh, on CFD simulation of off-design operating points of a centrifugal compressor. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Nielsen. I will now share the screen. Hopefully everything is working for you as well. Yes. Thank you. Uh, perhaps I would like to, first of all, uh, extend the title of this um, presentation with the pain of CFD simulation of off design operating points. Uh, this is uh, the work of one of our master students, Mate, uh, who was um, terrified of presenting his work in front of open form experts. So I took over uh, his job. However, he did an excellent master thesis, so we will first certainly forgive him. Uh, let's skip right into, into the introduction. Uh, first of all, on the left-hand side, you probably see something. Well, you, you probably haven't flown in an airplane recently, but you have seen uh, the enclosement of an axial uh, compressor. And we have chosen to avoid this one uh, in Mate's work and choose the centrifugal compressor, which you can see on the right-hand side. Um, it is quite challenging to simulate the operating points of centrifugal compressors since they have uh, a, a different uh, type of flow compared to axial ones. In axial compressors, the flow is always aligned with the axis of rot rotation, while in the centrifugal compressor, you will have the uh, direction from going from axial to radial at the outlet of the impeller. And then you have to have, uh, for example, in smaller uh, jet engines, you have to have guide vanes or diffuser vanes at the outlet to redirect the air uh, again into the axial direction for the combustion chambers. Uh, the greatest uh, advantage of centrifugal compressors is that they have uh, a larger compression rate compared to a single stage of an axial compressor. However, they would need a much larger uh, frontal area to be able to pass through the same uh, airflow rate as the axial ones. If we skip into the uh, objective of the work, Mate's job was to simulate uh, the so-called design operating points of the uh, centrifugal compressor and then to uh, check whether uh, we are able to go into the so-called off design points. Um, Centrifugal compressors and turbo machinery in general can be shown uh, via a diagram such as this on the left hand side, where you have characteristics uh, which will give you the functional, the function between the airflow or the mass uh, flow rate through the compressor and the achieved compression pressure ratio. Uh, these are the characteristics which correspond to fixed uh, rotational velocities. And you have also denoted here points on each of the characteristics, which correspond to the maximum possible efficiency for that uh, certain uh, rotational speed. Uh, the line which connects these best efficiency points is called the operating line. And it, uh, the operating line is limited on the top of this diagram by a surge line. And here it is not drawn, but on the bottom, there will be a choke line. So the surge line and the choke are two critical operating conditions of the compressors, which are achieved either for a, a smaller uh, mass flow rate and larger compressor, uh, compression ratio, so for the surge, or you have a large uh, airflow uh, rate and you have a small pressure ratio if you go into choke. Uh, surge can be aerodynamically described as stalling of 
all or um, appearing of recirculation in all of the blade passages of the of the compressor and it is quite dangerous since you can even have reversed flow so flow going backwards in your compressor while choke is um, characterized by appearing by maximum velocity appearing in the blade passage so you'll have a Mach, uh, Mach number equal to unity and you cannot uh, pull or pass through any more uh, mass flow rate than you have at that certain point. I won't go into the details of mathematical models since I think this is the most boring bit. Uh, however, the thing that is maybe not uh, familiar to all people or people who do not deal with turbo machinery, the energy equation is written in a special form for turbo machinery with the term called Rothalpy, which includes both enthalpy and also a component of energy which comes from the rotation of the rotor. Regarding the uh, compressor that we have chosen for our simulation, it was a geometry provided by Finnish scientists uh, referenced here. Uh, and it is a geometry with the following uh, characteristics. Um, it is quite a high speed uh, compressor, as you can see here. And it is specific since it has the so-called splitter blade. So the, its design is special because it has a splitter blade in the middle of the channel enclosed by these long blades, uh, which serves its purpose, which is to uh, make the flow more uniform or to uh, redu reduce any recirculation or turbulence which may appear. Since the master theses are limited in time, uh, Mate has uh, chosen to work with uh, a stationary approach or uh, only we have chosen to simulate only a single uh, blade passage. And here is the part of the geometry shown on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the mesh, the density of the mesh. So it is a fully uh, structured, a block structured mesh um, on the splitter blade. So you're looking at the splitter blade here. It is about 7 million, 7, 7 million cells. And it was a long process of uh, generating this mesh to uh, be of a high quality. Uh, it was, I think, two months of iterating uh, the elliptic solver, uh, which is available in pointwise, similar to the previous presentation, which we have seen. Uh, and Mate did a great job here, even though we were at, uh, we had some really, really um, large crises during his master thesis. Regarding the numerical model and tools, uh, as I've said, we have chosen the froze, frozen rotor approach or the MRF zone for the rotating zone here. On the right hand side, you can see the parts which correspond to the inlet, which is placed on top here, and the diffuser, which comes at the bottom here. Uh, since it was only a part of the uh, rotational geometry, we have used cyclic boundary conditions on the long blades and also GGI boundary conditions, so interpolation uh, on the interfaces between the stationary and the rotating zone. And it is also useful uh, for assigning boundary conditions for the jumps in rotalpy, which occur because of the rotational velocity. Eight minutes. The, thank you. The design operating points uh, which Mata is simulated are shown in this operating map. So he, uh, he has chosen three points at different rotational velocities. And these are all best efficiency points for which there was uh, some experimental uh, data available. And we have compared uh, the results to the experimental data. First of all, we were looking at the mass flow rate, which was uh, achieved in the uh, blade passage. And the relative difference, the largest relative difference that we have seen uh, was about 10%. Um, and since the measurement uncertainty uh, for the research was about 6%, uh, we were quite uh, satisfied with this result. Uh, regarding the, the nice colorful uh, pictures, this was also intended for uh, as a teaching tool for our turbo machinery courses at the faculty. So we can uh, go into the operating map, which is quite unattractive, and show the uh, students, for example, what happens at the point number three regarding the flow field. 
And you can see here on the left hand side that we have a subsonic velocity field. So there is no uh, there is no Mach number over uh, unity. You also see the temperature field with some diff uh, interesting patterns here at the outlet. So this could also uh, be a problematic, our approach, since we have the volute, which will usually enclose the impeller. However, we do not uh, have the exit from the volute. So there is uh, definitely some uh, margin of error there. Then we have also compared uh, to another set of experimental data, the pressure rise in the diffuser uh, area. Um, here on the left-hand side, you can see if you're a turbo machinery uh, enthusiast that the uh, reaction of the stage is approximately equal to 0 0.5 since the pressure increase in the rotor and the setter is approximately the same. And on the right hand side, uh, on this um, plane here, we have also compared the uh, pressure rise. The blue points represent the experimental data, while the red line corresponds to our calculated uh, pressure, and the shaded area corresponds to the measurement uncertainty. Ten and a half minutes. The last part of his of Mati's research was to try to achieve um, a critical condition and he was able in that short amount of time uh, to achieve a condition corresponding to choke. I will go back to the operating map. He chose the point uh, which he simulated already, number one, and he decreased the pressure at the outlet uh, while he, um, he kept the rotational velocity constant until we have uh, seen a shock wave appear here at the leading edge of the splitter blade. And you can also see the jump in the pressure here uh, where the shock is located. So it is possible to simulate a choke on this uh, reduced uh, piece of geometry. For future work, uh, probably Mate won't be doing it since, since he will be busy with the Exafone project. Uh, however, some other students uh, will try to achieve near stall or surge operating conditions. Uh, however, I believe it will be necessary to switch to the full uh, geometry and also conduct a transient simula simulation. So it will be uh, quite a long uh, time uh, until we will be able to present these results, hopefully uh, next year live in England. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tessa. Uh, so we have time for some questions. Uh, we have a couple of questions here already. Per Adamsen, uh, what's the reasoning behind the high number of cells in the simulation? Is it based on an, a mesh independent study? Yes, we have conducted mesh independent study. However, uh, the main uh, reason behind the large number of cells is the mesh quality. Since it is a quite, um, I will go back, it's a, it is a helical geometry. And we have found that with a larger number of computational points, we are able to control the quality better with the elliptic solver. This is the main reason. Okay. We have a question from Herb Jasak as well here. Uh, maybe that is complementary to the previous question. Can you please tell us about some problems with mesh generation we encountered with point-wise, specifically about constraining points onto the curved mid-channel surfaces? Yes, we had a lot of issue uh, in the beginning with simulation crashing or breaking down and we didn't know why. And then we found out that there are some points which weren't aligned to the uh, CAD geometry. Um, there is quite a long story about that because we have chosen a different uh, piece of the geometry to, uh, to model. And uh, I have been able to make it work. However, if we go and zoom in onto the inlet, for example, uh, this uh, plane is not straight. So it's curved in some places. And we are still not sure why, because it is constrained as it should be in point wise. Yes. Uh, we always tend to come back to mesh and the geometry problems. Yes. <laughs> Next question here is uh, from Ivan Batistic. Is the input geometry for pointwise in STL format? Uh, yeah, we had CAD format, CAD and STL. Uh, the picture here is shown on STL because it's, it was nicer. Yeah. Yeah. 
I don't know if that question was about that maybe you have some distortions due to the STL format or not, but... Uh, ah, it was, uh, we had both. We had both CAD and STL. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I think we are running out of time, so, and we are running out of questions as well. So thank you very much, Tessa. Let's move thank on you. to the next presenter, uh, which is uh, Mr. Jonathan Falbeck from Chalmers University of Technology who will present uh, a numerical simulations of counter-rotating pump turbines with a new head loss pressure boundary condition. Please go ahead and present. Yes, thank you very much, Håkan. I'm just going to share my screen. So I guess that you're able to see my screen right now and I'm just going to enable the laser pointer. Yes. So yes, the title of uh, my presentation is Numerical Simulations of a Country Rotating Pump Turbine with a New uh, Head Loss Pressure Bound Condition. Uh, my name is Jonathan Falbeck and this work is made together with uh, Håkan Nilsson, who is the chair of this uh, session, and also Saeed Sali, which you heard uh, earlier in this session. So the outline of today's presentation is that I will roughly cover what pump hydro storage is, describe its purpose and its principles. I will also uh, show you the control tipping pump turbine that is uh, evaluated and uh, then I will uh, give a motivation for the new uh, head, head loss pressure bound condition, uh, give a system overview and also what head losses is and then also explain the functionalities of these bound conditions and then I will conclude with some numerical, uh, some numerical settings and results of course. So if we start with the uh, pump hydro storage <coughs> So the whole idea is that you use hydropower as a water, uh, water battery. So when there is a surplus of energy in the electric grid, for instance, when you have a lot of uh, wind energy or solar energy, then you, can, then you need to store that energy or you can store that energy via pumping water from a lower reservoir up to a higher reservoir. And later, when there uh, isn't as much energy in the grid, uh, then you can reverse the flow so it goes from the upper re reservoir to the lower uh, reservoir. And this provides a grid stability and a solution to uh, store energy. <coughs> so pump hydro storage uh, can be a, a key component to have a fully renewable uh, energy system since uh, the typical intermediate uh, energy sources, wind and solar, can, you cannot store the energy from those in a very convenient way. So the typical layout of a pump hydro storage power plant is that you have an upper and a lower reservoir a powerhouse where you have a pump turbine unit. In this case, it's a counter rotating machine. And then you have pen stock connecting the two uh, upper and lower reservoirs. So the principle of the counter rotating uh, pump turbine, I'm just covering briefly, is that the first runner rotates in one direction and it, and it will swirl the flow, creating an angular momentum. The downstream runner will then make use of that angular momentum and de-swirl the flow as it rotates in the opposite direction of the first runner. <clears throat> so if we look at the simplified system view, what a, a pump hydro storage system is, is that you have a lower and an upper region, you have some piping, and you have a pump turbine unit somewhere in, be in between. So in turbine mode, i.e. when you extract energy, the flow will go from the upper surface to the lower surface. And when you want to store energy, it will go from the lower surface to the upper surface, and that is pump mode. <laughs> and typically, the numerical domain when we simulate uh, um, these machines is just concerning the uh, pump turbine unit itself. We don't really care about the system, or we try to mimic the system via some predefined boundary conditions. <laughs> In this work, we have, tried, we have developed a new boundary condition that can cope with uh, losses in a system, so we can include an entire system. So now I will show some examples. We have, for instance, uh, uh, friction in the pipes, we have uh, valves, and we have entrance effects and exit effects, and we have made some heavy instruments. All this will influence the flow rate. So it will be very hard to, at any given point, just say that this will be the flow rate. So we, want to, we wanted to develop a simple method to get an estimate of the flow rate at any given uh, point as the... Um, <coughs> as the machine will deliver the work or extract work from the system, depending on its work as a pump or as a turbine. So we have derived a new head loss boundary condition, which is based on the available total pressure boundary condition. 
And the idea is that we apply uh, the Bernoulli's principle or the, yeah, the Bernoulli's principle at an inlet or an outlet patch. So if we look at the kinematic pressure, i.e. pressure divided by the density at point two here, we can describe it as the pressure at uh, the upper surface here minus the dynamic uh, pressure going in plus the head difference. And then we will have minor losses as it, that is one time losses in the system. So for instance, the valve uh, or entrance effects in this case. And then we will have friction losses due to the pipe. So the developed boundary condition, it can take any number of these minor and uh, friction loss factors. So we can have in series how many uh, instruments or valves or bends as we'd like. And, the, and the, it can be as long pipes as we like as well. We have also added a function one statement for the head and one minor loss factor. Th that this is because the function one st statement allows the user to supply table files so we can uh, simulate transient uh, operation operating conditions. For instance, if we want to close a valve or the head of the uh, of the station changes. And one very important aspect is that for an inflow case, uh, the pressure at the patch will uh, decrease due to that the losses are upstream or yeah, due, due to that losses are upstream. And for an outflow case, the pressure will uh, increase since the losses are downstream. And as you can see in the formulation, this boundary condition is uh, only developed for a kinematic pressure, i.e. an incompressible flow. So the test case that we have looked at or the numerical settings for the test case is that here we have the full numerical domain. Uh, it's quite hard to see in this picture, but in the middle here you have the two runners. So uh, upstream runner is red and downstream runner is, is blue and they will rotate in opposite direction from one, one another. So we have specified this uh, uh, new uh, head loss pressure boundary condition of both the inlet and the outlet together with the pressure inlet outlet velocity. We have used the K omega SST SAS model to account for turbulence, and we have evaluated mesh sizes in the in region from one to ten million cells, as you will see in the next slides. And uh, yeah, the uh, numerical properties or the FF scheme sticks. It's that we use a backward scheme, a linear scheme for most of the uh, variables, and the uh, yeah, convective terms from the momentum equation. We have the last uh, scheme. And uh, of course, we use the pimple algorithm, uh, which allows for uh, greater time, time steps with a maximum number of 10 outer uh, correction steps. I should say that it usually converges within three or four uh, corrector steps. And yeah, we use the smooth solver for velocity and the turbulence quantities and the GMG for uh, pressure. So if we go over to one of the case that we that I have looked at is that now I'm, we are looking at the startup sequence. So the runners, they rotate at full rotational speed and we slowly open a valve. So we are looking at, we will be looking at this transient sequence where the valve is first fully closed and then the valve will start to open. Yeah, this synodious function and then it will be fully open at four seconds. So all of this is handled by the boundary condition that we have developed. So. And if the valve is closed, that means that the loss from the valve will be high. And if the valve is uh, open, then the loss will uh, decrease with the opening of the valve. So, he so here we will see an animation uh, of velocity on the green and yellow surfaces when the, this loss factor, i.e. the valve, is open. So at first you just see that the flow is spinning around. <laughs> and as the valve suddenly open, you will see that flow is pushed uh, towards the correct direction, so from left to right. And now we see that most of the flow is actually going in, in the correct direction. And we can see some nice uh, uh, vortex shedding of the downstream support shot. And there is also a very complex uh, flow pattern uh, of the counter rotating machine. But the whole idea was that we should evaluate if we could get reasonable flow rates. And we have done that with we have done this with a number of different meshes. So from 10 million cells down to uh, 1 million cells, and we get fairly similar uh, results. I will explain later why we have done this for a number of different meshes. It's not just only to see if you have mesh convergence. Uh, but, uh, but as far as we can determine, we get relatively good flow rates. This will later be 
uh, validated with experimental tests, but those are not being conducted yet. So you'll see how good results really are. And then if we look at the head, this is here defined as the total pressure drop from the uh, inlet to the outlet. And we see in the beginning it jumps a lot. And that is because this K factor, it is very high in the beginning. So a small change of velocity will mean a very large change in this head, but quite quite fast it, it converges to the same value for all cases and the case setup so it is roughly nine meters of head between uh, the two surfaces and this is done with the developed bound definition. So, uh, <laughs> so the conclusions of this work is that we can estimate the reasonable flow rate as said this will later be validated how reasonable it is but with this method we have developed a very simple uh, method to model a full system and uh, changes to the system can be made through the function one statement. Right now we have included a head and one line loss factor, which can be changed over time. And the idea is that we later going to run optimization studies. Uh, that's why we did the, uh, that's why we evaluated several different measures because uh, we want to investigate transient, transient sequences with this boundary condition. And for that we want to have a small mesh as possible. If you want to hear more, more, hear more about my work and the works of my colleagues here at Chalmers, you are very much welcome to join the 18th of June, that's next Friday, uh, where Håkan arranged a variant of the Gothenburg Region Open Forum uh, User Group meeting. So please contact Professor Håkan Nilsson if you'd like to attend for the all day online Open Forum event. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And I would like to acknowledge the uh, Alpheus EU Horizon 2020 project from this uh, uh, work has received funding. So grant number and please visit the website and also there's a link in page. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, SNCC for providing computational, uh, <coughs> yeah, computational power and then of course Open developers and the community. So thank you very much for listening and now I will answer all your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so Let's see if there are any questions. I guess you're typing right now. There is no question right now in the um, live Q&A. Let's just wait a little while to see if... Um, can, you, can you maybe say something about the input for your boundary condition since this is the um, talk is about the boundary condition? Uh, do you have some example of your input that you can show easily now or uh, let me see. I don't have that easily attained, but you um, you you basically give a list uh, of here are my minor losses, uh, one column of minor losses, and then one column of uh, what diameter you will have at that minor loss, because uh, uh, a loss or a head loss, a pressure loss, scale quadratic to a change in velocity. So if we have a change in uh, diameter, for instance, in the pipe system, then we will have another loss dip. So you need to specify both the loss coefficient and the uh, yeah, and the geometrical change as you have in that section. <laughs> and for the friction loss, then you need to uh, specify uh, yeah the friction loss uh, coefficient and or no, you need to specify the surface roughness and uh, uh, yeah the length of the pipe, of course. And then it will solve uh, the, uh, I don't remember exactly the name uh, right, uh, right now, but it will solve uh, an equation iteratively to, to calculate the correct uh, uh, loss factor. Okay, thank you. We have two questions here. Uh, per Adamsen first. Uh, will the boundary condition be available as open source? I guess it's really, I should have mentioned this. This uh, boundary condition was developed as part of uh, a project or a course that I took at Chalmers and actually is the chair of this session who was the examiner of that course. Uh, he has a website where uh, every or all, all uh, yeah, everything, all the projects from that course uh, is uh, made available. So it is actually made available. Uh, maybe I can uh, try to show you exactly where it is since I still share the screen. Right now we see your uh, presentation still. Yes, now here you can see it. So we go to tft.chalmers uh, slash uh, uh, tilde sign Hanik Kurser OS CFT. 
and then you scroll down to the I attended the course uh, last year. So first you have the course material and then you have uh, the projects from all the participants. So here you can see uh, my contribution. And there is uh, both slides, uh, report, and also uh, the files which I used for when I developed the, the bone recognition. I should say that the bone recognition has, has been slightly updated since that report, but the basic principles uh, is covered in the report and in the files. Thank you. There's one more question quickly. Uh, what is the advantage of axial pump turbine from Selko Tukovic? Well, the advantage of an axial machine is that you can allow a higher, high, higher flow rate uh, and a lower head. So if you want to have a low head uh, station, you typically want to have an axial machine because a centrifugal machine will generate a higher pressure loss or it will, it, it's, it's more suited for higher heads. So an axial machine will allow for a higher flow rate, which is uh, very much preferable when you have a low head. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank so you. About the final question, so we have to move on to the presenter, which is uh, Mr. Thomas Schumacher from Engis, who will talk about rapid performance assessment of periodic turbo machines under incompressible flow conditions. So please share your screen and start your talk. The, the title of the presentation is um, Rapid Performance Assessment of Periodic Turbo Machineries, Turbo Machines under Incompressible Flow Conditions. Um, I'm basically presenting the work done um, mainly by, by George Capuzas and um, Paolo Geremia, um, who were not you know, terrified to present uh, in front of open foam experts, but um, just busy with, with other stuff. And Paolo has presented, I think, already twice during the workshop. Um, next slide, please. So to break down the the title uh, more is basically how to make simulations of water pumps run faster in Helix. Helix being our um, our main product um, based on on open foam technology. Um, and uh, I, I've skipped the the, um, the slide for for presenting Angus and Helix. Um, you probably have um, heard quite some talks from from our colleagues already um, the last couple of days. And there's I think um, one more. Um, tomorrow. So I just want to, to um, show some light, um, um, cast some spotlight on um, how we combine certain developments within engines um, to make you know things faster, robust. Um, and in this case, we are dealing uh, with water pumps and um, we're combining developments um, on a boundary together with the um, the coupled solver um, that we that we've written. Next slide, please. Good. So um, what we've done, um, what we're dealing here is a um, um, generic um, water pump geometry. Um, I don't know how I can, uh, you should click on the right hand picture that it's an animation. Yeah, okay. So um, this is um, 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 yeah one made up geometry. Um, we use the, the software CF Turbo for this um, since there's a cooperation going on. And um, we just put in some parameters here. Um, thanks to my colleague Paolo, who's done all the work in, in CF Turbo, um, putting in the parameters and getting the geometry out. Um, we decide for a, for a generic six blade um, water pump here. And um, already we can, we can run these geometries, these um, pumps with the, um, the coupled solver that we've written for incompressible um, flows. Um, and that gives us um, um, a decent speed up compared to segregated approaches, um, depending on the geometry and the case of like um, two to five times um, already. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the animation plays automatically, that's good. Um, so here we have the, um, um, the results of, of the case. I'm basically starting the, the presentation from the results and then go um, you know, backwards in time on how we, how we achieved it. Um, frame rate is a bit, bit um, bad here. Um, it runs smoother um, if you're all in the same room. Um, but you see here the, the velocity field, um, um, how the, the flow gets accelerated and then pumped into the volute and then out through the, through the outlet on the top right. Um, so yeah, there's just not much else to see here. Um, the interesting bit is in the next slide, please, Harken. Um, and this is the actual domain and the actual CFD model that we've run to achieve this 
um, this results. So what you can see here is that we only um, modeled and meshed and simulated a 60 degree sector um, due to this being a six blade um, water pump and um, treat everything as a, as a sector um, which is rotationally symmetric um, until we hit something, uh, a piece of geometry, in this case, the volute that, is, uh, that can't be um, represented by, by a sector. So um, in order um, to do this, then obviously we have to create um, a mesh. So uh, next slide, please. And um, here we, we um, teamed up with, uh, with Pointwise, which is now Cadence. Um, who were um, kind enough to, to create um, a pointwise mesh for, for this geometry. So we provided them with the, um, the input deck from, from CF Turbo. And um, thanks to, to Ulrich Fuchs, which I think is in the audience as well, he created um, a pointwise mesh for us um, that we then could import into, into Helix. Um, this is what's shown here. So you have the, the Helix graphic user interface and you can directly import um, pointwise meshes, for example, and, um, you know, get the mesh statistics. And in this case, we have an overall mesh size of, I believe, like 1.8 million um, cells. Um, there's some more mesh details in the next slide, please. Um, so what, um, what Ulrich Fuchs used here is um, a T-Rex mesh, which is basically a tetrahedral core mesh um, combined with um, unisotropic near wall layers to resolve the, the boundary flow um, and have some close-up and, and some impressions of, of what the mesh looks like. Um, we've also done the case with, with, um, with, with Snappy, with, with our version of Snappy, and it also runs nice, but um, since, since Pointwise is an um, yeah, expert in creating meshes for turbo machinery, the idea was to, to team up with, with them and, and see how that, how that um, tool chain works. Okay. Um, then coming, next slide, please. Um, then coming to um, why running this as a sector is beneficial. That's quite obvious. So um, the whole mesh um, for everything that's been treated as a sector is um, in this case, 1.1 million cell. Um, the non-sector mesh is um, 700,000 cells. So the full model in terms of cell count, um, we come up to 1.8 million, um, as we saw earlier when we imported the mesh into the GUI. Um, and now if you, if you um, copy this around and would have to run the full 360 geometry, that would basically create your mesh of seven, over 7 million cells. So um, just by, by running just a sector, you have a speed up already of a factor of four. It's not factor six, obviously, because we have the mesh of the volute, um, which you know, can't be split up. So, but factor four is already quite nice um, for something that has um, six blades. And then obviously, um, if you have geometries um, or cases with a higher number of, of blades where you can uh, make the sector um, even smaller than 60 degrees, then obviously that, that, um, that speed up um, will, will increase. Okay, um, going back in time further. Next slide, please. So how, uh, how did we go about it? Um, there's an open foam boundary called cyclic periodic AMI. Um, that we looked at, and it um, had some some issues, some problems, some um, yeah functionality missing. Um, mostly, I think the, the the most fundamental functionality that was not there was the um, capability to um, to make vector transformations between um, two sides. Um, so that needed to be to be put in, and 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 I think we basically or George basically um, rewrote the whole thing. Um, and it also did not have support for uh, non-integer patch-to-patch matching. Um, what we mean by this is um, highlighted on the right-hand side in the, bill, in, the, in the picture there, where we basically um, interpolate between a 60-degree chunk and a 90-degree chunk. Now, um, why would you do this? Um, if you have, for example, um, multi-stage um, um, geometries, that uh, where the the, um, the blade count is uh, different between, for example, rotor and, and, and stators, then um, you might end up with, um, say, having on one side a sector of 20 degrees and on the other side a sector of, um, I don't know, 22 degrees or, or something like that. Um, in that case, you don't have this one-to-one -one matching. Um, 
but it's still close enough to to being an integer patch to patch that the the error you do in, during the the interpolation is um, acceptable when um, weighted against the the performance increase of the simulation. Um, so yeah, as I said, um, George basically um, took the whole thing apart and put it back together again. Um, did something to the AMI interpolation class as well. Um, if you are interested in in in, in more details on this. Um, I can put you into contact with, with George on this. Um, and then also, we also we always have to make sure that um, what, what we code is um, pretty generic so that it works with, with all the solvers and all the technologies that we, that we put into, uh, into our software. So it has to work with segregated solvers, has to work with coupled solvers, et cetera. Um, the, yeah, by the way, the vectors there, this is uh, not a flow field, but just for demonstration, it's the, um, the normal vector um, of, of those surfaces being interpolated. Um, okay, next slide, please. Um, and yeah, that basically brings us to, to the next steps. Um, it's, it's not done yet. Um, it's, it's, uh, I'll probably say it's early days still. Um, and, and what we want to, to achieve down the road is um, to extend this to a, to a full um, steady mixing plane functionality. Um, that we can also use for, for other applications. Um, there are some additional technologies available, techniques available, for example, um, well, in, in CFX, who was quite of like the industry standard on, on simulations like this, um, something called time transformation, um, where you can make the, the simulations behave um, better for um, non-integer weight ratios. So where you have like, like large discrepancies in, in, in sector, um, with, I would say, um, and then obviously test, 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 um, make this um, yeah, multi-stage, see how that performs. Um, I, I've dug out this old Francis 99 um, test case. I think that was like a workshop from a few years back. So there's a geometry available for that, for this. So we want to, to look at this as well and basically uh, putting it through the motions to see um, uh, yeah, how robust it is, um, how we can break it, how we can um, improve it. We're at 11 minutes. Yeah, um, just one more slide, basically. Um, next, please. So take home messages is um, that, yeah, we, we extended um, an existing um, boundary um, and um, this could speed up turbo machinery simulations by a factor, which is, you know, roughly equivalent to the, to the blade count, um, depending on how much non-sector, non non-rotating geometry you have like down, downstream, upstream, that obviously affects it. Um, but it's of, of the order of the blade count. And then if you combine this with um, the faster solvers, for example, with the, the coupled solver, um, you can get a, a significant reduction in, in CFD um, simulation times if you combine all, the, all these techniques. And, and this is what we you know, specialize in, um, make these things um, as fast as possible to, to have uh, yeah, industry run on, on quick turnaround times. So um, yeah, I, I de deliberately did not put any, any numbers on the y-axis there. Um, that's just to show that, that um, we're talking about like order of magnitude, um, even more depending on geometry and case and, and solver that you choose. Uh, next slide, and then I'm done. Okay, thank you very much. I will see if I can, ah, uh, you want to have this uh, nice animation as well. See if I can kind of uh, stop the sharing here, I guess. And also, Thanks Hakon for being the guy who switches the slides. <laughs> Yes, it was very <laughs> difficult. Uh, no, but <laughs> it's not your uh, job. Perhaps no. helpful. Do, so uh, now I can see again the portal. So I am. Um, we are at the questions. Let's see if I can also turn on my video here if you want to see me. So uh, do we have any questions? I can't see any questions right now. Uh, Everybody left. You can no. There are still people here. Quite. <laughs> uh, at least there is a number. Um, any questions? They are typing right now. Uh, one thing that I wanted to check because you have you mentioned this non-integer uh, patch to patch interpolation for cyclic uh, periodic AMI. This seems to be similar technology as the overlap GDI in in form extend. Um, and I, I think I could see some effects of it actually uh, close to where this uh, volute or, or as we call it spiral casing in, in hydropower, uh, you get some effects because the, this spiral casing that you have is not 
does not have the same periodicity as the other parts. So, uh, uh, yeah, since yep. it's like 360 degrees. Uh, and I could see some effects on the flow in that region. Uh, so I, that you, have you seen that or have did you think about it? Um, yeah, well, we definitely thought about it. I think um, what we've done for this geometry, for this case here, we probably have gone um, a bit too far by making the, the the sector model too close to that um, um, to that volute. Um, I would probably put it uh, further upstream. Um, my my gut feeling would be that um, the, the the further away you are from from non cyclic geometries, you are um, the the less problems you, you basically get. Yeah, so basically stop at where the rot um, rotating part ends um, and then have this tiny little bit um, that sits between the, the blades um, and the non-periodic geometry um, to be also non-periodic. That would be, you know, like my, my, my next try. So we probably have been too aggressive in trying to model as much as possible as a, as a sector here. Um, so, and this is, I think, where, where um, the, obviously the feedback from the customers um, um, will, will help a lot and also um, putting it through the, through the um, available test cases and comparing it to, to other software and other, other data that's available will help a lot. Yep. Okay. There are no questions coming up. I hope that it is not because of that it is not refreshing, but I have try to refresh again here, but I don't see any questions. So um, the, this development, will this be uh, made open source uh, since you are uh, usually delivering your own versions of? We deliver our, our own version to um, clients. Yeah. So it will not be available for free on a website somewhere. No. Okay, uh, any questions or if not, um, probably not since I don't see any questions. Uh, there question there are that? questions in the discussion forum. There are? I think we, yeah, but I think there's two questions there. One from Herf, which I pretty think I just answered. Um, and okay. then one. In the discussion forum, I should do it. Okay. Have you answered the question? I don't see, I just see one uh, thing in the discussion forum changing the browser. Okay, do you see any other question? Yeah, uh, as I said, there's uh, one from, from Herf. Um, can, but regarding maybe you can. The, yeah, maybe um, you can. your software is open source. How can I see it? Um, I think that's pretty basically down the line. That's a question that you just asked. Um, it is open source um, and it's um, not freely available for download. Um, well, as you know, um, and then there's a question: um, What do you what do you feel can be a setback of simulating only a sector? And I think that all, also um, we, we answered with um, what you just um, said, Harken. Um, obviously, if you have, um, for example, non-uniform, non-periodic inflow conditions, then you, you're making an error. And also, um, if you are too close to geometry that's non-periodic, um, there will be an error as well. So it, it is kind of like, um, yeah, I guess like like the, the same error that you also do with like mixing planes, um, like for example, for fans, for, for ventilators. Um, there is a, a trade-off to be made between accuracy um, and, and speed up, obviously. That was all the questions I hoped. I don't know yeah. what to see them, but that's... Yeah, there, there's one more. Will the boundary condition work with compressible solvers? Um, yes. That's a quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're running late. Uh, so thank you for your presentation and thanks to all the presenters and also to the audience for attending. And um, that's it for today. So let's meet again tomorrow and... Um, yeah, have a nice evening or afternoon or wherever you are. So, bye.